Well, you know, listening to this, I, I had attempted to kind of compress a class that was a five credit, 10 week class into 40 or 50 minutes, the history of the city kind of. Uh, but I think um, I'm sort of uh, uh, flexible enough. I think I'll, I'll focus a little bit more than I planned on just waves of immigration, a little bit about the history of uh, arrival and adventure for people that are coming here from somewhere else. Uh, because we are, um, Tacoma very much is a, a, you know, a city of immigrants. Um, so, so, so anyway, I think there's an inclination to want to assume that any city in the American West is a newcomer and there's no history here. And I just want to start by, you know, first of all, acknowledging the, the native people of Puyallup's, uh, the indigenous uh, Salish people that there have been, we live in an urban place and there have been people living here and walking in the same footsteps we walk in for at least 12 or 14,000 years. Um, you know, the, unlike the Egyptians or the Greeks that had a big influence on changing the environment around us, the population of native people around here tended to be relatively smaller um, we think that the Puget Sound area probably at peak had somewhere around 25,000 native people here going back five or 10,000 years. Um, and the lifestyle, the culture was, was an oral tradition and it very much was one that was um, compatible and sympathetic with the natural environment around it. So there wasn't a big desire to make you know, for agricultural reasons or for monumental reasons to change the world around us. But that doesn't mean that people weren't here and that there wasn't a rich culture. There weren't uh, religious and philosophical ideas on the highest level uh, going on for thousands of years here. So to some degree, all of the time, I, all the people and all the stories I'm going to talk about in the next few minutes all happened in just a very small period of the history of where we live. And it's amazing to think about the adventures and the things that people have lived here have seen, the kinds of history that's unfolded here. Um, up near Squim, uh, 25 years ago in a bog, they discovered the bones of a woolly mastodon uh, and in the bones of the mastodon was lodged a spear point. Um, so we know for a fact that the native people that lived here um, were living at the same time that there were woolly mammoths and huge tigers and beavers bigger than buffaloes. Um, so really a, a tremendous history. And a lot of that informs the oral tradition the stories and the religions that have been with us for thousands of years and are still part of the culture of the Puyallup people who live here. And it is a unique thing about our city is that within our city is a sovereign nation and is a land where people with a great rich culture and history have been here and are still here and very much part of our future too, not just our past. So um, let me acknowledge the importance of the native people uh, who have occupied this land and created culture here uh, long before any of us, uh, long before the waves of immigrants started to arrive uh, here. Um, so I'm kind of skipping over the sort of this part of the world um, and during the 18th century where during the age of map making and exploration where European and Asian explorers and map makers began to come here and uh, really by the middle of the 18th century, you know, the 1700s, we know there were Japanese that had made it over here, Chinese by the end of the of the 18th century, by the 1790s, 1780s. We had, of course, English. The Americans were starting to come up, mostly trappers rather than map makers, mostly here for 
exploitation. Um, but we also, the Spanish were here with their fleets and their map makers, very much a, a world power at that time. Hence the San Juan Islands and Lopez Island and all these uh, Latino names. So that's very much a part of our culture. The Russians were here, uh, the French, uh, just waves of uh, explorers and map makers. And for the native people that were here, they were beginning to see the outside world in these sort of the technology of big sailing ships and stuff. When they were looking at the face of those aliens that were arriving, they were not just seeing white Europeans. They were seeing Asian and, and swarthy Russians and um, Spanish and listening to languages from the corners of the, of the world. Um, interesting for those uh, native people to continue to be a welcoming population and not a warlike um, discovery for Europeans who, or for explorers that were coming here. I'm going to skip over a lot of this, but one of the things that's in the DNA of Tacoma is that um, really at the end of the 19th century, after the American Civil War, during the um, sort of uh, 1800s, um, the, the technology of steam and the idea that um, the American colonies would grow all the way across the continent, that Manifest Destiny would take this fledgling nation and span the entire central uh, continent of North America. And uh, Abraham Lincoln actually, during the Civil War, chartered a northern uh, transcontinental railroad. So the, the at, once the Civil War was over and the just horror and the sort of uh, self-destruction of the American Civil War was coming to an end. There was a real push to the far west. And um, although there were wagon trains and, you know, the sort of movie uh, overland immigration of families coming into our part of the world, it really uh, becomes the advancing of and the technology of the railroad after the American Civil War that ended in 1865. After that, that really is the big push uh, for people coming out west. Um, and I'm skipping over a ton of stuff. Uh, the California Gold Rush and, uh, you know, just immigration coming here from China uh, because of the gold rush, as well as people from all over the world that were coming to the American West Coast, to the North American West Coast. Um, anyway, um, uh, the idea of a railroad, and, and you know what's important to think about this, the, the building of a railroad didn't just mean a uh, modern steam technology of being able to move freight and people. The reason you could build a railroad with just one track to carry trains going both east and west was that wherever the railroad went, the telegraph went. And that meant communication. That was like the internet of its day. So wherever the railroad went, the telegraph went, and where the telegraph went, you had mail and communication, the newspapers, the banks that could wire money. Um, just sort of, if you, if you were on a railroad line, you just instantly popped into the modern age from being a frontier town of log cabins into being a, a ultra-modern place. So the First Transcontinental Railroad that was finished in 1868 went into went from St. Louis into uh, San Francisco, but the Northern Pacific uh, Transcontinental, which is often doesn't get the same attention, was equally as important because it linked Chicago and the Great Lakes to Puget Sound, and in 1873. It was decided because prior to that, they knew they were going to build a railroad to Puget Sound, but nobody talked. It was a secret where they were going to actually have the terminal city. Where were they going to build this, this um, urban place where the rails meet the sails? 
where uh, overland transportation connected with maritime transportation to the Pacific Rim. And in 1873, while the railroad had been built all the way into Portland and was coming up to about where Tenino was, the enterprise of the Northern Pacific Railroad finally announced that their destination and the terminal city would be um, at Commencement Bay. And Tacoma won that lottery. And so for about 20 years, Tacoma was just a boom town. We went from a beautiful little natural port at the foot of an active volcano into an urban place. Um, and the building of that railroad um, instantly um, brought immigrants in waves, people in waves. Um, the builders of the railroad included Chinese who were famous contract laborers, uh, masters at the hard work of uh, advancing steam technology and also um, being able to get the single biggest obstacle for the Northern Transcontinental Railroad was, um, was getting through the mountain ranges. And the Chinese were particularly astute at uh, explosives and demolition work. And uh, there are a ton of great stories about the, uh, the firecracker men. Uh, Tacoma very early on had a large population, a large working population of, of Chinese. Um, famously, the uh, Irish and a lot of the veterans of the Civil War built the transcontinental railroads from the Mississippi Valley headed west, but the railroads moved in two directions and the building of the railroads from the Pacific Ocean headed east, the, the largest workforce tended to be Chinese. So. Um, Lots of miners and others thrown in there, but but anyway, that's all part of our early story in this sort of what Murray Morgan calls in his book Instant City. So we really never go through this sort of pioneer village phase. We go from a pretty much uh, natural environment with a small population of native people that tended to um, not big not build big buildings and stuff. They floated around and followed fishing in traditional ways, um, understood the land and moved around it with great fluidity and, and of course had canoes and traveled around. So um, almost a maritime people, the native people here. And then all of a sudden, boom, you've got a city being built. Um, I just want to Kind of make a point for this. I'll probably jump back and forth a little bit, but the in this story about the building of the railroad, and this is a huge story, a, a huge chapter out of the American story, the the story of our country, and the completion of that transcontinental railroad from July of 1873 when they were at Tenino, they had a an agreement with Congress that in order to keep all the land, the land grant system, all the land along the line of the railroad, which was given by the government to the railroad to be able to sell to pay for the building of the railroad. In order to keep all that, they had a contract that by December of 73, they had to be able to finish and bring a steam locomotive to Tidewater, to the Pacific Ocean. And they were at Tenino in July of that year and had just the remainder of that year to be able to get to Saltwater. Um, and this is an amazing story. I put up on the chat side my uh, blog, uh, and you can read more detail about this. It's just an absolutely exciting story about the race to complete the Transcontinental Railroad and the largely Chinese workers who, um, who rushed through that fall and that winter to be able to cl complete the line. What, the reason I focus on this, the, the line from Tenino into Saltwater was dubbed the Prairie Line became a, because it came across the prairie where, where uh, Fort Lewis, where JBLM is today. Um, and so it was named the Prairie Line. And when you stand in our campus today and you look uh, at the Prairie Line that runs through our campus, you're looking at the exact location where Chinese contract laborers rushed 
during those last months of 1873. And in all likelihood, one day in December probably of 1873, a Chinese contract laborer probably stood up where the trees were cut down and for the first time saw the completion, would have seen in saltwater, would have seen Commencement Bay from where the campus is today and would have seen the completion of Abraham Lincoln's dream to build a northern transcontinental railroad, to build a railroad to follow the path of Lewis and Clark across the continent and finally be finished. And that moment in history occurred within our campus. And you can walk out there today and if it wasn't for the big I-705 uh, concrete uh, freeway, you would be able to see that site that was probably seen by an anonymous contract laborer from China. So anyway, this is a shot of the prairie line and the buildings in our campus uh, during the 1920s. First plan for the city uh, was to hire uh, no less than Frederick Law Olmsted to lay out a plan for, for the city. And here is the original plan for Tacoma. Uh, he worked during the 1870, late 1870s to lay out this amazing, environmentally perfect uh, city with almost like rice patties that would have been cut like tables into the contours of the hillside, uh, lined streets and parks and all of the things that Olmsted would be famous for. Um, but in the rush to get the, the city started, and again, the railroad was worried about money, and they also knew that the most valuable land they were getting by building the railroad to Saltwater was the urban land, the lots in the downtown that they could sell to uh, business people, speculators, immigrants arriving, to anybody who wanted to put down roots in this new town of Tacoma. And so the Olmsted plan was abandoned and instead a grid was laid out. This is an early 1878 lithograph that just shows the layout of the city that, as it kind of first appeared. Um, I love these bird's eye views. These were done by lithographers back east who never came out here and they would have taken topographical maps that the engineers had drawn up and then taken um, uh, grid city planning maps and then would, because nobody could fly in 1878, it was impossible to get to this perspective, but they would create these bird's eye views as kind of a romanticized uh, document to appeal to immigrants and people to uh, come to this brand new city uh, on Puget Sound. And this will give you an idea of what that kind of first iteration of the city looked like. Um, the uh, square building with the with the the white building that's square with the chimneys on top was uh, Theodore Hosmer's house. He was the head of the land company. And to the right there, the bigger square building was the land office of the Northern Pacific Railroad. Uh, who And this is interesting about the city to keep in mind that all of the land in the city belonged to the railroad. So there was no more powerful force in the early days of Tacoma than the Northern Pacific Railroad. Um, Theodore Hosmer's house, that one that we see in the middle, is actually still standing. It's on 9th Street. It's the Exley apartment building on 9th Street. And this is interesting to kind of realize the influence of the railroad even today. From the very beginning, the railroad made money off of immigration and, and tourism eventually, and also off inexpensive labor, meaning Chinese. So although the railroad was, uh, was a big corporation and was, was definitely not a big hearted corporation. They were always advocates for immigration and for tolerance within the city because they didn't care what color or where you came from, as long as you could buy a ticket or buy freight or goods that came in, or you brought with you a trade 
that created products that then were transported by the railroad and the railroad made money off those. Uh, also, the telegraph, interestingly enough, was, uh, even though we use Morse code, the telegraph could uh, send messages in any language. Uh, and so money and messaging also was not uh, discriminating as far as ethnic background. And from the very beginning, Tacoma was populated by a rich ethnic mix of people. Um, the European immigration during the 1880s, 1890s, uh, was all over Central Europe, but from the very beginning, we had a Chinese population. Of course, there was always a native population here. Um, so um, anyway, it, it's part of the very early days of the city. Um, so that early picture was 1878, 1879. This is what we looked at like by 1895. So you can really get a sense of how explosive and how rapid the growth of the city was. It really, and big buildings, many of which are still with us today. And actually, when you look at the buildings in the campus today, um, most of the buildings in our campus are, uh, come from before 1900. They come from the, the, some of the oldest buildings in the city, the 1880s are now, academic buildings within the campus. Um, and Union Station is actually the newcomer in our, in the warehouse district. Um, the big building, the Garrison Woodruff Pratt building, the West Coast Grocery buildings are all 1891. The um, Massasoit building, Pinkerton building it's called, uh, is uh, 1889, so, uh, you know, real old timers. Um, and, and the other thing was that unlike a lot of the cities in the Pacific Northwest and the far West where they were built out of wood, although wood was abundant here, very early on the railroad would insist that the city be built in brick and stone so that it wouldn't burn down all the time. And uh, actually in 1889, the year of statehood, major fires destroyed Seattle, Spokane, Bellingham, and Ellensburg all in one year, and Tacoma had no major fire. We've never, in fact, had a major fire that destroyed the city, but we have gone through waves of development over time. By 1900, Tacoma's population was about uh, 38,000 people. By 1910, we were almost 90,000 people. So in the first decade of the 20th century, Tacoma doubled in size. Here's a look at, uh, at Tacoma in its wooden city days. And um, you, you can read on the blog, there's a, there's a blog post and story about wooden city, and it tells a much more detailed story about the kinds of wooden houses that were built and how the city looked. This wooden city though, was completely gone by 1895, 1900, and all replaced with brick and stone buildings. The other thing that it's really important to understand, and you know, we've kind of gotten to where because the activities of the port um, have been zoned into being industrial areas and because the business of the waterfront and the shipping and the travel of goods from, from rail into maritime, um, all that is kind of, we don't notice as much today, but what we have to keep in mind is before the Second World War, all the way back to the 1870s, Tacoma was first and foremost a seaport. And most of the daytime work activity of the city related around the waterfront. Um, it was, all important and it was part of our character. And, uh, you know, I've read before that the one place where it's most difficult to uh, become a fascist or to control uh, mines is in a seaport because <laughs> there's just people coming and going and ideas just can't be uh, tied up. Um, language and ideas are just things that we have constantly been a uh, a currency in, in, in Tacoma. 
and uh, they're kind of zoned away from us today, but um, for generations, the first generations of Tacomans, um, everybody um, focused on the waterfront. Um, one of the first big popular heroes and people to come out of Tacoma was a female character, uh, Thea Foss, who became Tugboat Annie in the 19, 20, late 1920s and 1930s. And her story is all about living on the waterfront. Uh, she operated a towboat operation and was kind of a superhero in the 1930s. Um, but she came here with her family, the Foss family, and with the railroad in 1889. And then uh, through uh, about uh, first 15, 20 years of the 20th century, built the Foss Tug Company, which was the largest tugboat company on the West Coast for generations. Uh, and it's still a big enterprise today, although it's corporately owned now. Another quick thing about the waterfront was when you arrived here as an immigrant, um, didn't make any difference. I mean, you could get a job on the waterfront um, heavy lifting, hard work, but it didn't require that you be able to speak or write English. And so uh, the workforce, the waterfront workforce tended to be very um, diverse, uh, very mixed uh, batch. So another look back and the, the large building with the clock tower on the right is City Hall. And then the building uh, on the left across the street across Pacific Avenue from City Hall is the headquarters of the Northern Pacific Railroad. This picture is probably from about 1915, 1920. And you can see the warehouse that ran, a mile long warehouse that ran along the Foss waterway. That waterway was dredged by the railroad and that warehouse was operated by the railroad, controlled by the railroad. And the one thing that kind of set Tacoma back from Seattle and Portland and other places was because of the land grant and the control, the railroad, the Northern Pacific built, um, built warehouses and wharfs all the way along the waterfront to block uh, any competition. So the Mosquito Fleet um, maritime transportation was hard to compete with the railroads around here. Uh, because they wouldn't allow anybody to use their wharfs. It wasn't uh, profitable to the railroad. Finally, in 1913, we finished the Morgan Bridge, which took, flew people over to the port area where industry and big mills and stuff took off. And that broke, finally, the control of the railroad. I'm really skipping through this quickly because the... Uh, passage, the waning of the control and influence of the railroad over the city really carries all the way up into the 1920s. Um, and these photos are of downtown uh, in the 1920s. Um, before I jump this far ahead, I just want to say that the, the um, immigration to uh, Tacoma and to the far west um, really um, um, boomed all the way through the from 1900 to about 1922. Uh, we had waves and waves and waves of immigrants coming in. And, uh, you know, as a result, all over town, we have churches for various backgrounds. You know, there's the Buddhist temple, a Japanese Buddhist temple. There's the um, uh, Polish Catholic Church, there's a Greek church, there's, you know, that, that kind of represented the various neighborhoods or barrios around the city that tended to be um, fairly ethnic. And, uh, and those waves of people came in and really did uh, grow the city so that we were, by, um, by 1910, we're up to about 80,000, by 1920, we're up well over 100,000 people. So we're a considerably large city, although by then Seattle and Portland have outgrown us. We're the third city of the, of the Pacific Northwest. 
uh, and by far the most diverse city um, um, in, in the Pacific Northwest, so. Michael, can I jump in there for yeah. just a minute? Yeah. Um, I put on our Canvas thing, um, University of Puget Sound uh, students and faculty put together a website on the Chinese expulsion. And um, I put it up so people can go through it and it's got lots of great detail. Could you just comment on that a, a bit? Uh, and because you mentioned about the Chinese. Yep. Yeah, I kind of went over it. I'd also uh, on the website at KCTS, our public TV station, there's also a really good hour long documentary about the uh, Chinese. And you'll read a lot about this. Um, in um, in uh, 1880s, there was a backlash as the railroads were kind of completed being built and uh, there was beginning to be unemployment. We had a bit of an uh, uh, economic setback in the middle of the 1880s. Um, there were speakers who started to go around and, and uh, speak against the Chinese. They were a uh, uh, um, contracted workforce and they worked for a lot less money. And so once white former miners, uh, Irish and whatever, uh, started to lose their jobs and here are the Chinese still working, they uh, reacted against that. Starting in Northern California, there was an Irish speaker who kind of went on the Chautauqua circuit. I can't remember his name right now, but began a series of uh, discussions about um, uh, getting rid of the Chinese. I think the Chinese Exclusion Act is a little earlier than 85. Mike, do you remember? Yeah, um, 1882. 1882. Yeah. So there was starting, yeah, the, uh, on the East Coast in Congress, there was starting to be a, a reaction against immigration. I know Henry Cabot Lodge out of Boston was a big advocate for uh, cutting back on, um, on um, Asian and, and uh, he, he was sort of opposed to Eastern European and Russian Jews and Greeks and Italians too. But, um, but it really fomented around the Chinese in the far West. And there were a series of mob actions against the Chinese in Northern California, Eureka. And then uh, a really inflamed event happened in November in Tacoma in 1885 after a committee was formed in Tacoma that included the mayor and uh, Judge Wickersham, a municipal court judge here, some very influential uh, newspaper editor, uh, and they created a, basically a, a, a mob, a, a civil group that uh, planned a removal of the Chinese uh, in November of that year. Tacoma's Chinese population was grouped uh, largely around where City Hall is today. It wasn't built yet. There was a, a commercial district there with restaurants and uh, stores and the Chinese merchants living here. And then uh, there were some um, uh, camps on railroad property built on stilts out along the waterfront going towards uh, Old Town. And the railroad provided land and protection for the Chinese because they wanted the labor, basically. Um, but um, finally, they had this mob had planned and published in the newspaper and everything that when the whistle went off in the big mill down on the waterfront, that the mob would move on the Chinese. And uh, there's a wonderful chapter on this in Murray Morgan's book, Puget Sound, about the mob moving first on the Chinese merchant area and, uh, and you know, with torches and guns, I mean, the whole horrible thing, um, rounding up all the Chinese, literally the entire population. Uh, there were a few exceptions, um, Ezra Meeker, some other railroad people that, that stood against the mob. There are some very brave episodes along the way, but in the end, uh, the mob led by the mayor and community leaders 
uh, marched all of the Chinese, basically just told them to take everything you could carry and that's all. And they marched them all the way out almost to Lakewood uh, with the mob and screaming and taunting them, marching them all the way out on a rainy day in November and then loading them on trains and shipping them off to uh, just putting them on boxcars that they had rented and shipping them off south. Um, a few weeks later, Seattle did the same thing and uh, said, you know, the, the, the organizers said, well, you know, this is the Tacoma method. Uh, they know what to do with these people. And so Seattle played out the same thing. Um, so for a generation, really, we lost our, our Chinese population. Um, what was the name of the woman who wrote about that, you said? Sorry. Uh, for, uh, well, the Murray Morgan in, in his book, Puget Sound, um, I'll, I'll hold up a copy of the book um, um, so you can get it. But um, Murray has a long detailed story about, um, about the Chinese removal. Okay, thank you so much. Yep. Uh, there's a new book out too that um, it's called The Chinese Must Go. It's not about Tacoma, but there's a chapter on Tacoma and it uh, covers the whole story, I think, um, by a Chinese American woman from Yale, I think it is. She spoke over UPS uh, a couple of weeks ago, be before the virus. Um, People wonder why there's no Chinatown in Tacoma, and that, that that's why. Yeah. Yeah, what's remarkable about Tacoma was that it was the publisher of the newspaper and the, the mayor of the city, a man named Weisbach, and then the municipal court judge all leading the mob, so real civic leaders that were kind of in charge. Great. You know, I'm going to swing back just uh, quickly. Um, the a couple of big events that happened in the late teens that are that really influenced the shaping of the city um and a big one was that in 1917 the tacoma pierce county voters went to the polls to pass a bond issue to buy 70,000 acres out near uh, the prairie, near the Nisqually River, and then give it to the army to build a military base. And that, that origin of Camp Lewis, what became Fort Lewis, was a gift from Tacomans. We passed it 80% to give the land to the army. And then the war broke out in April of 1917. America went into the war and thousands and thousands of board feet and jobs went into building the fort um, and getting it up and operating, uh, building an army post here. Uh, by uh, early 1918, there were 40,000 young men flocking to this newly built military base. And uh, through 1918, we, it grew into one of the largest military bases in America. Um, the reason I bring that up and make a point about it is uh, that, of course, also in 1918, the mobilization of young people traveling by railroad and the teens by 1920 was kind of the last gasp for transportation by railroad. But what it did was it forced people into close <clears throat> contact with one another. And the flu pandemic of 1918, as you heard about in Barstow's interview and her book, really hit Tacoma hard. We were a um, we were a target for all of the young soldiers coming here to go into the military, and all it's December, you know, it's September, October of, of 1918 was cold and rainy, so people were packed indoors and into the Rotunda Union Station arriving and uh, the flu just smacked the city. Tacoma was, because we were uh, an urban center, 
where there were a lot of people that worked in the woods or worked on the waterfront tended to spend their wages here. We also, from the very beginning, had a very large theater district and adult entertainment district, if you like. Uh, the city was very tolerant about um, enforcement of prohibition that passed in Washington state in 1918, but it actually passed in Tacoma in 1910 but it was never really very seriously enforced. But also uh, gambling and uh, you know brothels and just kind of the adult entertainment was always part of the economy in Tacoma, as well as movie theaters when that finally came along, vaudeville, burlesque, all those. By 1918, when the Pantages was finished, on any given night in the downtown, there were 10,000 seats and they, uh, on a given night. And all that was smacked by the flu epidemic when it hit in 1918. The other thing that's really important and that isn't talked that much about was that um, the Puyallup Reservation, um, when the Dawes Act had passed in the 1880s and the federal policy with native tribes and reservation system was that they were gonna set up Indian schools and Indian hospitals uh, to take care of native people. Tacoma um, was a, a center for the Indian school here in Tacoma was huge. It was bigger than anything around Seattle or Portland. And there were Indian kids, um, Inupik and Aleutian, uh, uh, Aleutian kids, uh, Alaskan natives, the kids that were sent down to go to school in, uh, in Tacoma. So the Indian school was very large here. And then they built a Indian hospital, the Cushman Hospital here, that was also very much operating during the first 20 years of the 20th century, very large. And when the flu epidemic hit, um, it the blessing was that it tended to not influence, not affect children very badly. But strong adults, um, unlike the, the pandemic we're in right now, the COVID, the, um, the 1918 flu affected um, young people, healthy, middle-aged young people, 20s, 30s, were the ones who were hit the hardest. Um, Tacoma's deaths were in the hundreds. On the reservation, the, uh, well, unfortunately, alcoholism and some other problems had diminished the male population. Most of the, not most, but a good share of the big decision-making with the Puyallups were done by women, which was traditionally, there was a pretty much shared governance anyway. But it really took its toll on moms and young men in the Puyallup Reservation. You know, I mentioned that we think there was a population of 20 or 25,000 native people in Puget Sound prior to contact with the Europeans. By the time the first explorers got here, uh, smallpox and other diseases that were introduced on the East Coast had made their way all the way across the continent. So we think there were only about 10,000 um, native people here by the time the Europeans arrived. But there were probably 20,000 at its peak. Uh, the Tacoma tribe, the tribal population, the children survived, but that generation of parents were really impacted by the 1918 flu. And the Cushman Hospital, Indian Hospital, was converted into a public health hospital, and it dealt with um, tuberculosis and uh, lung diseases. Uh, and then also dealt with uh, PTSD, um, dealt with um, soldiers coming back uh, from, the, uh, from the First World War. And the, um, the uh, Veterans Hospital out at American Lake was built in the 20s to replace the public health hospital that was at Cushman um, on the hill there on McKinley Hill. Um, in fact, I, <laughs> I was shocked. I'm kind of a fan of the detective writer Dashiell Hammett, who had tuberculosis, was a World War I vet, and was in the hospital there 
Hammett actually in the Maltese Falcon, his famous novel that became a famous movie, uh, there's a chapter on Tacoma that isn't in the movie, but it's in the book. And uh, Hammett was there. Um, and one of the one of the treatments they had for the lung disease for the people that were there with lung problems with tuberculosis and with recovering from the flu, uh, the Cushman Hospital is where they first experimented with menthol cigarettes. So it's a weird idea, but anyway, apparently everybody smoked, but menthol made your tuberculosis better, I guess. So anyway, um, we go on into that uh, much more, uh, lots of anecdotes and lots of stories about the uh, effect of the flu. Literally the same thing we're doing today, all the theaters closed, all the restaurants closed, the fort shut down its operation, the Cushman Hospital pretty well shut itself down uh, during the flu epidemic. Um, so it was uh, very, very much akin to what we're experiencing today. The 1918 casualties in Tacoma though are, look like we won't come close to those with the COVID experience here in terms of Tacoma Pierce County, in terms of casualties and residual uh, effects of the flu. Hopefully, I shouldn't, being a historian, I should never try to predict the future. I can barely keep track of the past. But anyway, um, that seems to be what's happening. M Michael, do you have any yeah. idea how many people died in Tacoma in 1918? We think it was somewhere, uh, not counting the tribal losses, which were probably in the 250 to 300 people which is a huge bite out of the tribe, but we think it was somewhere around 600 in Tacoma. The worst day we had, we lost 90 people in one day. Uh, that was in um, November of 1918. I can't remember the exact date. Yeah. Okay. Interesting story. The First United Methodist Church was just finishing a beautiful new stone church that sat 750 people, a big dome, spectacular building up on uh, K Street near where Tacoma General Hospital is. Just an absolutely stunningly beautiful, one of the biggest churches in the city. They were just finishing it when the flu hit. And because it was right next to the um, hospital, the physicians from the hospital met with the congregation and they asked them if they would turn the hospital, the, turn the church over. It wasn't even sanctified yet, so it was still unused. And they came and the congregation came together and decided they would uh, turn it over to the hospital. And it became a uh, isolation ward and a morgue for the Tacoma General Hospital. Um, no greater gift, boy, uh, for that congregation to turn over their shiny new church to uh, that horrible event. So, and that There's church a... later got torn down and became part of the hospital complex. Yep. Yeah, it's, it's now a parking garage. They, the hospital finally bought it uh, about 2005 or something and then tore it down. It was still in great shape. So, yeah, I'm skipping over all my preservation, my physical architectural stuff here. So, anyway, uh, but yeah, that's it. Um, I'm also going to kind of skip over the depression a little bit, but let me just, uh, I, before we get out of the 1920s, let me go back here just a second. Um, Tacoma plays an uh, important, a really key role in terms of national immigration policy um, during the 1920s. The congressman from Tacoma, who was a uh, journalist, uh, worked for the Tacoma Ledger, uh, for Sam Perkins, publisher of the paper, and then uh, in the early 20s went over to run um, uh, the Sam Perkins paper in Aberdeen, was elected in 1919 into Congress. His name was uh, Albert Johnson, Congressman Albert Johnson. There was no more virulent racist and eugenicist in the Congress than Albert Johnson. And uh, he was 
particularly ranting where the East Coast was the the anti-immigration movement on the East Coast was motivated by the waves of uh, Eastern Europeans and Southern Europeans moving in in the 1920s, starting to move in in the 1920s. Uh, on the West Coast, um, uh, the big push was against uh, Japanese, Asians, and uh, Bolsheviks and the Wobblies, the um, sort of Marxist uh, uh, sort of uh, political uh, labor forces out here. And Albert Johnson was uh, ascended very quickly because of change of president and then the rise of the, the new version of the Republican Party. Albert Johnson became chairman of the House Committee on Immigration and naturalization and it began, he held hearings here in Tacoma in 1921, really targeted the Tacoma's Japanese population. And uh, you can read a lot about this on my blog. <coughs> it's an area of particular interest to me. But Albert Johnson will go ahead and eventually create the um, uh, in 1921 with the sympathy of our state governor, Governor Hart at the time, <coughs> who was also very much a racist. Uh, we began um, creating legislation that wouldn't allow Japanese immigrants to become citizens. And then it wouldn't, and they couldn't uh, own property. Uh, eventually they weren't allowed to lease property um, own any kind of real property, would never become citizens. And when the industrious Japanese farmers in the Fife Valley and in Tacoma's very large Japan town downtown uh, made up the entire area around where uh, everything from where the, um, um, the Murano Hotel all the way down to Union Station, that entire area, as well as our big public markets, was all part of Japantown. <coughs> Excuse me just a second. Anyway, they were the targets of Albert Johnson's um, vitriol. <coughs> and at the same time, he got fascinated with the idea of eugenics and racial purity. <coughs> and uh, with the rise of the local Ku Klux Klan, began to convert his political power into federal policy. And in 1924, uh, the Reed Johnson Act was passed, which um, created quotas for the first time on immigration and completely excluded immigration from Asia. <coughs> and it was Albert Johnson, chairman of the committee, that that, commit, that, that um, major policy that may be the single most significant change in American immigration policy came with the Reed Johnson Act in 1924. And that Johnson is our congressman. So uh, it's, um, and, and the stories of what's going on in Tacoma during that time, uh, the Puyallup area where the Ku Klux Klan was very much uh, revitalized in the 1920s. Um, you know, we, we didn't have any documented lynchings, but the um, sort of mob actions and uh, and the advancement in particular of the theories of eugenics, which really affected, um, really began to affect uh, social policy in, in, mostly in the county in the rural areas. Uh, but but that this is a figure who we should all know more about because he is, he's, he's a, um, uh, he's a truly powerful dark figure in American history and he's from here. And we don't think about all that immigration policy change at the federal level as having its roots in the Pacific Northwest, but it very much does. Um, and, and it's because of, of his enforcement of that act in Tacoma that he insisted upon that led to when um, 
when Pearl Harbor was bombed and the Japanese, the 140,000 Japanese, most of whom were American citizens, children, uh, were interned. The reason that very few came back to Tacoma was that the uh, they couldn't own any property and all the property was sold or um, seized uh, during the Second World War. So um, anyway, I, I could... Well, um I have a suggestion. I, um, I wonder, if we're covering a lot, and I wonder if um, you want to take some questions and some conversation and then uh, cover the rest of this next week, or um, how are you feeling? There? Yeah, we're running kind of long, and I'm sorry. It's so hard to compact all this. Um, well, it's great. It's great, but it's a, we're just covering a lot, and we're not yeah. reading, we're not reading a history book of Tacoma. So this is really great. And uh, we're, it's recorded too, so people can go back to it. Um, but maybe, maybe this would be a time to do a little bit of discussion. And um, usually I'm trying to run this so we go maybe two hours or something, but then, uh, you know, normally when we have this class, it's four hours, but we break into groups and we go to the library, we do all kinds of things. Why so, don't we do that? My, if there's questions or whatever, and then maybe next week we could talk about, I mean, the period of the Second World War coming forward involves, you know, the military base and the Korean immigration, so many soldiers that married Korean wives and the, the large Korean population we have that come during that period, our Indo-Chinese population that come during the Vietnam period the civil rights period here, the immigration of African Americans during the Second World War. Um, I'm fascinated that you have people interested in Latino uh, immigration here because I've been working with Dr. Erasmo Gamboa on a Latino project identifying historic places associated with, um, with Latino. And I grew up in Yakima. <laughs> Uh, and as did Erasmo, and so the whole uh, Mexican and Central American immigration here um, and, and the growth of that. And then more recently, again, Russians and Eastern Europeans and um, 